Absolutely. My name is Craig Ciccone. I'm an independent historian from Detroit, Michigan. Okay. Okay. First and foremost, thank you so much for stopping by the platform. I really appreciate what you're doing. I look forward to hearing more about the research that you have done. Um, my next question is, when did you develop this passion for history and doing research? No, absolutely. In high school, I think I was exposed to uh, what we refer to as the big three, the the three major political assassinations of the 1960s. So, so John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy. And once I was bit by that bug, um, history just assumed my my thoughts and my and my desires, I suppose. And it was uh, it was very early on in my studies, actually, in the early 1990s, that I saw a documentary called The Murder of Fred Hampton. I had never heard of Fred Hampton before, but um, I was compelled to watch it because of, of, of my background in political assassinations. And I was just the, the interesting thing about this documentary is that it was a half documentary, half evidentiary um, video that is. The film company that went into Chicago to film Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party um, was in the midst of making a documentary on them when Fred Hampton was was killed. So not being able to complete the documentary as they initially conceived, they then went to Fred Hampton's apartment while the smoke was still filled in his in, in, in the, the air and started recording the condition of the apartment after the police had raided it and killed not only Fred Hampton, but also uh, Mark Clark, who was a downstate Panther leader in, in Illinois um, and had shot and severely wounded four other people. So they were taking they were taking evidence from the the apartment to make sure that it was preserved, because once the police raided Fred Hampton's apartment and killed and maimed everybody in it, they left it. They left it open. And then the Black Panther Party started having public um, tours through the apartment to see what the police had done to Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party. It, it wasn't there was nothing malicious about it. They simply wanted to inform the public and to see the cruelty of the police brutality that white people had been reading about, but rarely experienced for themselves. So you invite the community in to show look, this is how it goes down. This is how black people are treated in Chicago, especially if you are a Black Panther Party member. Uh, but it also affected the crime scene. Having all those people traipsed through Fred Hampton's apartment, it, it affected the crime scene. But the film crew wanted to make sure that they preserved as much of it as they could. Um, and so half of that film was Fred Hampton speaking at several speeches and uh, meetings that he had with different organizations and organizers in Chicago. And the other half of the documentary was about his assassination itself. And I was just mesmerized when I saw it. I was mesmerized by Fred Hampton, not necessarily by his assassination. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, now my next question is this, what makes the death of Fred Hampton different from a typical police shooting where they may shoot an unarmed black person? because a lot of people will say that he wasn't murdered. Absolutely. Fred Hampton's assassination can best be characterized as a state-sponsored assassination. That is, uh, local, federal, and state authorities colluded and planned to assassinate Fred Hampton, and they did so. The, the raid on Fred Hampton's apartment in December of 1969 was the culmination of the FBI's, the Chicago police, uh, especially their intelligence division and their gang intelligence division, and the, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office that had been not only investigating and surveilling Fred Hampton for the last three years of his life every day, but also a concerted effort to destroy the Panthers and its leadership to make sure that there was that that the black community was divided um, in its approach to uh, challenging the status quo. So the FBI, the police intelligence and the state's attorney's office in, in Cook County, um, like I said, colluded to plan and execute this raid on Fred Hampton's apartment. 
it was a two bedroom apartment in, in downtown Chicago. And in, in fact, it was just a couple of blocks from Black Panther Party headquarters. So it was a hub of, of activity uh, of the movement itself. And Fred had only been in the apartment for a couple of weeks before they decided that, well, if you have all these people going in and out of the apartment and a lot of them are exercising their Second Amendment rights to arm themselves, then that must mean they're stockpiling weapons. So through an FBI informant who had infiltrated the Black Panther Party, which most a lot of us know, his name was William O'Neill, and he was profiled in a recent uh, film by Shaka King called Judas and the Black Messiah, which, which basically outlaid the story of both Fred Hampton, the Black Panther Party, and William O'Neill. Based on information that he gave them about Fred Hampton and the apartment, they were able to know exactly who was in the apartment at the time, the layout of the apartment, where the furniture was, so that they could, in fact, plan this raid. So the state's attorney uh, created this, this very uh, specialized, hand-picked, tactical um, group of officers, and it was called the Special Prosecutions Unit. The Special Prosecutions Unit then, with the FBI's cooperation and the Chicago Police Intelligence, devised a plan to raid this apartment early in the morning. So these 14 officers that were part of the Special Prosecution Unit were able to bring as many weapons as they wanted, so they each brought two to three weapons apiece. They were allowed to bring their own personal weapons from home, which then couldn't be traced or logged or tracked, right? And they even brought a machine gun. So two groups of officers entered the front of the house or the apartment and the back of the house at the same time and basically converged on all of the people who were staying in the middle of the apartment. So at the time of the raid, there were nine people in the apartment. Because it, Fred Hampton's uh, apartment, which they referred to as the chairman's crib, um, always had people in and out of it. If, if you were out of town, needed a place to stay, even if you weren't a member of the Black Panther Party and you needed a place to stay, Fred's apartment would be, would be the place to go. So it was filled with people. So when the police raided and, and fired no less than 130 rounds into the fixtures of the apartment and the bodies of its occupant or, or the, the occupants um fred hampton had been killed and mark clark who who was the leader in peoria had been killed four other people had been seriously wounded um and the police claimed that the reason that they fired so many uh, shots was because they were immediately met by return gunfire from the occupants of the apartment the investigation into the shooting showed ballistically, scientifically, that only one bullet could be traced back to a Panther weapon, and that was Mark Clark's weapon. Because Mark Clark was, he had positioned himself against the door because there was no lock on their front door. So he was basically barricading himself against the door when the police were outside, and the police shot through the door. It went through Mark Clark's chest and basically traversed his body and and just and blew his heart out and in a muscular reaction he shot he shot the the the, the sh shotgun that he had in his hand that was the only shot that was ever fired at the police so it was not a shoot out it was a shoot in despite the fact that the police maintained that the, that the Panthers were firing their weapons and it was a, it, you know, it, it, one of the officers commented that if it lasted two minutes, it lasted 10 minutes, uh, that, that the brutality of the Black Panther Party shows that we had to meet it, meet that force with, with lethal force. When, of course, it could only be proven that only one of the shots had actually come from a Panther weapon. So... Fred Hampton's assassination was unfortunately not unique of the 1960s, but it was the most egregious example we have of a state-sponsored assassination. That the that that the law enforcement on all levels 
colluded and conspired to take this man out when he was only 21 years old. Man, that's crazy. Um, I would like to know your thoughts. You had mentioned the film, The Judas and the Black Messiah, as someone that has done extensive research on the assassination of Fred Hampton. How did you feel about the portrayal in, in a cinematic sense and in a factual sense? Do you feel like they missed their mark or were they on point? Yeah, it, 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 see, Hollywood films never, never claim themselves to be factual. Uh, sometimes they say it's based on a true story or based on real events. Uh, obviously, Hollywood does not want to produce documentaries. So they want something cinemagraphic. They want something that's going to appeal to a, a large group of people. So I understand the, the methods that, that directors use, that they have to use to tell a story, and a complex one at that, where they use, um, you know, they take things out of chronological order, or they, or they bring five events together in one to make it seem like it all happened at the same time. It, I understand the convenience of all of that. But I don't agree with Shaka King's vision of Fred Hampton. The, the limited scope and, and view and vision of what he was, who he was, and what he was able to accomplish in just a very short period of time, and the promise that he held going into the future. Um, a lot of the times, and I don't agree with this, whether you're talking about Selma, whether you're talking about Malcolm X, whether you're talking about Judas and the Black Messiah, these gimmicks that directors use, they have somehow convinced themselves that a fictitious rendering of something that actually took place is more dramatic than what actually happened. And that's not true. Or it shows that Shaka King simply didn't know enough about Fred Hampton and the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party to see the drama that is built into what all of these people were trying to do for their community and their state and the country. I'll give you just one example of that. There's a scene in the movie in which Fred Hampton is arrested at one of the locations where the Black Panther Party had their free breakfast for school children program in which school children before school could come and get nutritious breakfasts because that was a problem in the inner cities in, in a lot of the major cities was, you know, how can school children learn if their stomachs are hungry, right? So the Black Panther Party in Chicago, just like all over the country, uh, they provided breakfast for, for, for children uh, programs in like five different locations all around Chicago. So in the movie, Fred is depicted as having been arrested at one of these locations. Fred was never arrested at a breakfast for, for school children location. But on January 24th, 1969, Based on the information that the FBI informant William O'Neill provided, Fred was arrested in, in the lobby of a television studio in downtown Chicago before he was about to go on um, the Howard Miller program as a guest. So think about that. Fred's about to go on air to Chicago, you know, on television and present his case and, and tell people what the Black Panther Party is about because they had just recently been established a few months earlier. Um, he would have had exposure. He would have been out there in the public and that would have been damaging, of course, to the status quo. So instead of letting Fred Hampton actually go on air, they they conspired to prevent him from going on air by, by arresting him before he could even go. But the people who were with him that is um, Bobby Rush, who was the deputy minister of defense for, for the Illinois Black Panther Party, and several other members were with Fred Hampton at the time. Fred was arrested. They still went on air. So they, could, they, in fact, went on air and said, look, our chairman was supposed to be here, but the pigs just arrested him. This is the state of Chicago and metropolises all over the country. Look what they do. Look what they look at that. What they go to to prevent us from reaching out to the community and informing you guys of what's happening. Um, that would have been incredibly dramatic had Shaka King decided to show that. 
that Fred was arrested before he could even go on TV. That would have been a lot more dramatic than him being arrested at the Breakfast for Children program. Okay, okay, definitely. Um, now I would like to know this. At the time of Fred Hampton's assassination, was it something that he had done specifically or was it an accumulation of things that he had done up until that point that had got him assassinated? Well, the Black Panther Party was already declared as the number one threat to our country by the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. And a lot of people are familiar with this declaration that, that we have to fight the Black Panthers. But in the 1960s, of course, the FBI and its illustrious leader, Fred, um, J. Edgar Hoover, who was incredibly paranoid, but also he was a, a, a stalwart of, of, the, of the status quo, of the government. But he was also paranoid. So when you have people who are trying to change the, the, the way in which people are treated and people um, are employed or housed, or if you're trying to make changes to a system that took lots of years to, to, to get to where it was, um, that's a challenge to the status quo. And all of the movements of the 1960s were under investigation and surveillance of the FBI and local police intelligence agencies. Um, so the Black Panther Party had already been designated as one of the, uh, the greatest threat to the United States. Um, and so Fred Hampton, by extension, being a part of this, Fred Hampton was a little bit different because he was so young and because he was so successful. So the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party was co-founded by Hampton and Rush and a few other people in November of 1968. By January of 1969, Jagger Hoover had made that pronouncement that the Black Panther Party was a threat. So Fred Hampton, who had already made a name for himself in the suburbs of Chicago, uh, the outlining areas of Chicago and Chicago itself, having now been... Uh, deputy chairman of one of the most successful branches of the Black Panther Party, he was a target. He had already been a target since 1960s, late 1966 and early 1967, but especially now, now that he has a national platform like the Black Panther Party. So this was not, you know, the, the youth group, the youth arm of the NAACP in Maywood, Illinois. This was now a national stage. And Fred Hampton stepped up and he impressed the National Black Panther Party leadership so much that by the time Fred Hampton was killed, he was slated to take over the leadership of the National Black Panther Party because the top four people in the Black Panther Party, that is Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, the two founders of the, of the Black Panther Party in 1966, Huey Newton was in jail. Bobby Seale was on trial and probably going to jail. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver was in exile in Algiers. <clears throat> and then that left chief of staff, David Hilliard, who was facing criminal charges himself. And he was trying to decide whether or not he was going to face those charges or join Eldridge Cleaver in Algiers in exile. Had that happened, Fred Hampton would have been the next in line. And this cat was only 21 years old. He was he had he had not only taken the Illinois Black Panther Party and made it one of the most successful chapters in the country, but remember that he also did it during his tenure. He was in prison for three months because he had been convicted and and sentenced to two to five years for. Uh, unarmed rob robbing of of an ice cream vendor in in maywood so he had so he served three months during his tenure as deputy chairman of the illinois black panther party so in an even shorter period of time fred hampton was energizing not only illinois but he was also traveling a lot to wisconsin to uh michigan to ohio um, he was overseeing some of the branches and chapters in New York, Louisiana, and other places. So he was the de facto Midwest 
spokesman for the National Black Panther Party. So he was impressing people left and right in a very short period of time at a very young age. And had Fred Hampton made it to the national spotlight, I do not believe that they could have killed him at that time. Because think about all of the Black Panther Party members that were killed from 1967 to, well, we could say 1982, which is when the Black Panther Party ceased to exist. <clears throat> but we're saying from 67 to 74, most of the Black Panther Party members who were killed by police or killed outright were the young, grassroots, local leaders, not the national leaders, because they were in the spotlight. They were, to a lot of people, they were deemed untouchable. And had Fred Hampton made it to that, to that position, I think he would have been untouchable as well. So what was Fred Hampton doing at the time? Well, Fred Hampton was, like I said, he was moving up the ladder of the Black Panther Party nationally. He was traveling a, a, a great amount to, to take the plight of Black America to all corners of our country. And two weeks before he was killed, he even went on a tour of Canadian universities. So he took the Black plight of America and went into Canada, where they were having their own troubles, not only with Black liberation, but also uh, the Native Americans in uh, Canada. So he met with representatives of the Indian Métis organi or, or, or organization. Um, and so it wasn't just him, a matter of him going into Canada and saying, dig me, I'm here. It's all about me. He wanted to know what the problems were for indigenous and black people in Canada as well. Much like Malcolm X, much like uh, Marcus Garvey, he was taking the the experience of of black america and and making it a nation or a, or a worldwide concern he was taking it internationally so that's what made him so dangerous wow now i would like to know what is the current status of the assassination of fred hampton is it considered um case closed is there people that are still alive that um, can still be held accountable? Is there more information out there? Yeah, unfortunately, Fred Hampton's case is not like Emmett Till or um, like Medgar Evers or even like Malcolm X, where their assassins, we knew who their assassins were. They were found not guilty or they some of them were put in prison uh, and then justice was, was um, finally meted 50, 60 years later. The police officers who murdered Fred Hampton, well, of course, were never were never tried in a criminal uh, court because charges were never brought against them. In fact, the authorities went to great measures to make sure that they um, had legal and federal um, pronouncements of justifiable homicide. OK, so they had a they had a federal grand jury that investigated it and said, no, the police were, were justified. They made some mistakes, but they were justified. So none of the officers ever um, faced criminal charges. However, they did face civil charges. So right after Fred Hampton's assassination, his family, plus the family of Mark Clark, plus the survivors, the people who were in the apartment and survived the raid, all brought a civil suit against the city of Chicago and the FBI and the state's attorney's office, um, suing them for the um, uh, for denying everybody in the in that apartment their civil rights. the The civil case lasted 13 years and ended with a settlement in 1982 or 83. So they finally settled out of court but for $1.85 million. Now that's $1.85 million for the attorneys who had been working on this case for 13 years and then for the seven individuals or family, or, you know, families of, of, the, of the people who were killed. That's not, that's not very much money. 
especially when they were suing for, I think the initial number was $46 million. So technically the case is closed. They did settle. Uh, there was settlement money paid out, but no admission of guilt or uh, even responsibility, taking responsibility for what they did. The civil trial was, was able to show how the FBI and the police intelligence agency and the state's attorney's office colluded to make this happen. They simply could not prove it in a criminal court because charges were never brought. So the case is closed, but I do no justice was not served in this case whatsoever. And I, I am not sure how many of the original officers who raided that apartment are still alive. Most of the FBI officials, including J. Edgar Hoover, are long gone. Um, so unfortunately, justice like that cannot be, um, cannot be obtained today. But we can still talk about it and we can still talk about the legacy of Fred Hampton. Um, and and that, that is, is, to me, just as important as having justice being done for the people who took his life. No, my, my battle with the FBI over Fred Hampton's file has been 25 years now. So they still have not given me everything that I've requested. So yes, it is. It, but that's exactly what, how the FBI functions. It's through attrition. They want to frustrate the requester so that they know that most people can't afford a lawyer to compel them to give you the materials that you are entitled to. So they frustrate the, the Freedom of Information Act requester to the point where they simply just give up. So we are almost about 30 minutes in and I wanted to ask you about uh, one more case. Um, I was able to get familiar with you through Eddie Allen and I interviewed him about his research of the murder of Donald Goins. And, you know, Donald Goins is such a mythical figure. There's a lot of controversy about how he died and who was behind it. And in the book, he actually mentions you and you add a different perspective to what may have happened to Donald Goins. If you could talk about that a little bit. As a matter of fact, uh, it wasn't until I met Eddie Allen and, and started uh, consulting for him that Donald Goins and his girlfriend were shot just two blocks from me right here. Because, I, I mean, I, I say I'm from Detroit. I'm from a, a small enclave in Detroit. It's called Highland Park. And so this this happened just a couple of blocks away from me. So um, what I did for Eddie Allen is because of because of my background in political assassinations, he wanted me to 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 um, to read and um, evaluate the autopsy reports of both Donald Goins and his girlfriend. And based on what I read and and you know the lay person that I am, even though I have experience uh, in reading several autopsy reports, uh, it could have been that Donald Goins wasn't even the target. That it could have been that his girlfriend was the target, just based on the number of wounds, the how um, the proximity of the gun to the victim, and you know. Uh, certain aspects like that of how they were found, how their bodies were positioned in the house and how it seemed most likely that, that, um, that his girlfriend was in fact the, the, the target for whatever reason. But, but um, that was really all, all Eddie wanted me to look at were the autopsy uh, reports and, and to give my opinion based on that. So. That is definitely, um, a unique perspective. You know, I've been a Donald Goins fan for a long time. I read about 10 of his books and, you know, I've heard different theories about what people think may or may not have happened to him. And I've had my own opinion, but I never would have guessed or thought or even fathom that he wasn't the intended target. Yeah. I mean, but, but that, that, those kind of elements in, in a, in a, in a violent murder like that is incredibly important uh, like Fred Hampton. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Fred Hampton had three different autopsies. He had the official autopsy the morning that he was killed. Then the next day or that evening, I think, the same the same night. 
No, it was the fifth, the next day. Um, an independent uh, pathologist did an autopsy on Fred. Then Fred was, was sent down to uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, where his family was originally from before they migrated up to Chicago. He was buried in Haynesville, Louisiana. And um, three months after his assassination, he was exhumed and had a third autopsy. So, so, and, and because of the, the marks on his body, uh, because I have the autopsy photographs from his second autopsy, Fred Hampton was shot no less than five times. And so, and, and there's, there's powder burns and stippling on his face from the two head wounds that show that the gun was in close proximity. So that's why it's so important to study you know, and to make a determination of how someone was killed, then it leads to the why or, or, or the who. But but uh, the investigators, the FBI never bothered with that. I definitely want to thank you again for taking out the time to come by and stop on the platform and sharing this information. I truly appreciate the work that you have done, and I look forward to the work that you have coming in the future. I want to thank the viewers for tuning in. It's been another phenomenal episode. So until next time.